And we were told we can do it all. We can have it all. And while I think there's parts of that that are true, it's not have it all at the same time. Because corporate America and the way that work was established, the 40 hour work week even, was not created with women in mind. I think I allowed that narrative to consume a lot of the decision making that I was making and the sacrifices I was saying that I needed to make in order to make all that work. And in reality, as much as I thought that everything I was doing was, you know, for the loyalty and the recognition and like all of my work was being valued, the moment that I said I was gone, I was replaced in a second. Welcome to the About That Wallet podcast show, where we help you build strong financial habits. I have the wonderful opportunity to bring on Stephanie Gonzalez from the Women's Health Effect, a personal finance brand for women where it's her firm belief that more money in the hands of women leaves a lasting legacy on their personal lives and their communities. So how are you doing today, Stephanie? I'm doing good. It is Friday. Um, and so I'm trying not to do tons of work because I like to protect my Fridays. But conversations like this are what, you know, make my Fridays and protecting it worth it. So I'm happy to be here. Thanks for inviting me. No problem. Thank you. Because um, I think we met in FinCon. Uh, yeah. Briefly, near, I think it was like that Friday. It was a Friday. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Friday was like the Saturday because everybody was packing up that day. Yeah. It was a Friday. Um, and you actually got one the uh, one of the awards there. A lot of my friends did, but I didn't. But uh, I, I was standing up for everyone's. I, I wasn't nominated for anything either, by the way. Okay. But that's okay. Oh, that's uh, but but you know, I will take some credit for showing up and <laughs> support for a lot of the amazing creators that were there. Yes. That I was so pumped to see. The recognition and the love and support they were getting so you probably thought i won an award because i was up jumping up and down and cheering yes. on you know because <laughs> i was like hey she's everywhere so because i was looking at some of the highlights and you were like oh, <laughs> hanging out. Um, so what was your biggest takeaway from that actually yeah you know coming from the corporate space and not having been given, I guess, the opportunity or not taking the opportunity, not given, taking the opportunity to be a part of a community like this. I was just so blown away at how transparent people were about offering help and support and guidance on how to, you know, run your business. Even the other thing that I was really surprised about was people that are literally pursuing financial independence retire early are attending FinCon. Mm -hmm. um, and that was really awesome. And I, you know, I was thinking about this because I was thinking about FinCon for this coming year. And I was like, I really want to offer the opportunity for women that have come through my program to be able to sign up and just have access to the wealth of knowledge that is jam packed into a few days. But certainly the community element, which is what I was told by you know, everybody that had given me advice on how to make the most of FinCon and uh, uh, yeah, the people that were there really to improve their own personal finance situation and continue their journey. And so that's one of the things I like about it was that it gave the, mm -hmm. uh, it shed some light on some of the gaps of knowledge that a lot of us probably don't talk about uh, too mm -hmm. often because it wasn't, um, I noticed that I think since this was my first one, it was actually pretty yeah. cool to see uh, how helpful, again, people were. And then on top of that, um, it was just like highlights of people with PLCs. And that was really cool that yeah. to see so many people actually start to talk about it. Because when I asked somebody, I was like, hey, have you ever heard of anybody, um, a person of color in a uh, podcast? And it was like, no, I didn't know of anybody. And I was like, well, nice to meet you. And then <laughs> so it was actually pretty cool to see people in that arena to one that actually share their knowledge and get uh, some wealth of information from other creators. Yeah, yeah. And you could definitely get a sense that FinCon as an organization is really trying to make an effort. Um, and, you know, effort's one thing, but really put in the work to create a diverse environment in the space of financial, personal finance, mm -hmm. um, you know. I want to say it was one of the biggest turnouts, but the Women of Color podcast meetup was mind-blowing. Um, and that was 
women who have their own podcast, people who wanted to be guests on podcast, people that were like, I think I want to do this, but I'm not sure. Um, and I, I think out of all of the different events that I attended outside of just the speakers, that was probably the most connection and relationships that I made out of, you know, the entire program was that one meetup. And I mean, if you saw the picture on the website, it was a huge group of women that are you know, trying to get at this thing and get it done. Yeah. So what got you into uh, FIRE? Because you were able to achieve it at uh, age 38. Yeah. Yeah. So we're partially there, but, you know, we could be fully there if we chose to make some decisions <laughs> that we should make. Um, I have been in working in the technology supply chain for the last 15 years. And so I grew up really at one company. I stayed at one company for my entire career. And I think the intersection of me becoming a mom, uh, a senior uh, leader at the company, being an expat in Singapore, and, you know, these types of roles are pretty grueling when they you know, put a lot of trust in you to go and do some transformational work for a company. And this is like one of the top three IT companies across the globe. So this is a very big company. It's a, there's a lot at stake. Um, and COVID was happening. And you you can only imagine anybody working in the supply chain during COVID, their lives changed in terms of how their work looked. Um, and for leaders, we had to figure out how to lead in a very different way and solve problems in a very different way. Um and my husband and I were just having all these active conversations about my issues, not being able to look in the mirror and recognize the person that I saw back in myself. Uh, I had let a lot of what I thought was my identity uh, be completely pent up in, in this box of what Stephanie was in the corporate space and in, through a corporate lens. And I used to have all these passions. Like I danced flamenco for 10 years when I was younger. I was am a singer i can i can sing um i love live music i love to cook i now have these two beautiful boys i had this wonderful husband who, who is incredibly supportive but all these things that surrounded my life that were amazing that i used to love and derive joy from i just wasn't even given the opportunity to enter and be a part of my life any longer i wasn't making the time nor the space because work was consuming that and we took some time through couples therapy to really talk about, okay, what was going on with Stephanie? What was she dealing with? And the funny thing is, is sometimes you go to couples therapy and think you're going to go and fix your spouse or fix right. all the things that are potentially <laughs> and you know challenge for them. But lo and behold, a lot of what came out of couples therapy was a lot about what was going on for Stephanie. Um, and of course, I was like, I can't leave this job, you know, all the money and the and I was making all these excuses to not figure out what was really going on. <clears throat> and our therapist asked us like, Steph, if things aren't going well in terms of like how you see you want work to intersect with your life, and let's say you decided to leave tomorrow, why don't you and your husband go and map out what the worst case scenario is just so you know what that could look like? And through that exercise, by the way, my husband had been seeding me fire for years. And I just wasn't making the time to like watch the YouTube video or whatever it was that he was sending me. Yeah. And he was really, you know, dabbling in the the learnings and the teachings that Dave Ramsey had, right? Um, and we sat down and we really mapped out our numbers. We just said, okay, you know, what are all the baby steps? We mapped out our numbers. Like, what, what are all those things? Um, and because I'm a highly analytical person, we mapped out our expenses. We mapped out our net worth. We looked at what I made as, you know, a multi six figure earner now in my 13th, 14th, 15th year of my career. My husband is an entrepreneur and had been at it for seven years and was already making six figures as well in his business. Um, and I was like, wow, we have this ridiculous opportunity in front of us to just be intentional with our money and allow Stephanie to make a pivot in her career should she choose to do so. The, that was the conversation around like, how did we even enter into our fire journey. Mm. But then I started thinking, you know, I was incredibly passionate about developing women in my job corporate capacity. And I felt like I would look around the room or the Zoom room really at that time and go, I feel like there's a lot of other women suffering in silence the same way that I was, not able to understand what all this was for and how to leverage the job and the income as a tool and not a, a, an individual self-defining thing. Um, because when we did map out our numbers, the amount of control 
clarity and confidence I got in my situation, like all of the things that were just intersecting as like this mess of messiness at that point in time in my life really just kind of went away. Um, and so we really started figuring out, okay, what's our plan? When might Stephanie exit? We really planned on I wasn't going to leave until the end of 2024. Mm-hmm. But I started crunching the numbers even more and even more. And of course, we made the decision to move to Portugal, which is a lower cost of living country, not the lowest, but lower than Singapore. Mm-hmm. And um, I had three options on the table in front of me going back into work after maternity leave in 2022, 2021. Wow, it's been a while now. Yeah. Um, and I made the decision to leave my job in April this past year and pursue Women's Wealth Effect full time after I had started that in August 2021. Nice. That is a lot yeah. to unpack, but that was a lot that um, you've done to actually put yourself in the position to actually take advantage of those uh, things, because a lot of people will probably say that you're mm-hmm. lucky. And yeah. the I always go back and forth on luck because it's like you don't see the grind that was done before what you see today. Mm-hmm. And you guys yeah. really put in a lot of effort. So what was those habits Uh, that you and your husband had to do to kind of well first he was already on board and it was just getting you on board but what were the habits during that time frame um to start crunching those numbers what did that look like you know if we put this in the in the frame of a couple because i think when you and i were talking we were talking a bit more about this lens of personal finance in a couple setting Mm -hmm. i do think that for couples navigating the space of money you really have to just listen and understand where the other person is coming from and learn to appreciate their different experiences, the way they grew up, the way that they saw money modeled for them or didn't see money modeled for them. And quite frankly, for my husband and I, um, we both didn't see money necessarily modeled for us uh, tremendously, but he always knew he wanted to be a millionaire. Mm. Always. And he would tell me like, when I am a millionaire, and it would make me cringe at the beginning of our relationship because I had all these negative connotations, honestly, at the beginning of like my life of what millionaire meant, like greed, rich, right. maybe not humble. I don't, there were those things that were seated in my mind for whatever reason. And so it made me uncomfortable at the idea of pursuing the, being, becoming a millionaire. Um, but then once I realized that millionaire is this the number and there are so many other things outside of what you could do, and then I started realizing that women had this tremendous opportunity in front of them to enact different ways of thinking with money into organizations, into communities, into their families, um, we go about it very differently as well, that world and society could really benefit from more women having more money in their hands to do good and and to create positive impact. Um, And so, you know, I think us having conversations early, being transparent about who was going to pay for what, we never, I say never, we did not have any joint bank accounts up until this past year. We've been together for 11 years and married for seven. And so while we didn't combine our finances in like a operational way we talked about our finances there was a lot of transparency with our finances we understood each other's credit scores like mm-hmm. joe and i in a way almost got married before we got married and for whatever <laughs> reason we just saw our union as this very serious thing and i'm glad that we did like we gave it that level of um seriousness and maturity at the beginning we almost talked to each other like business partners at the beer beating we're very much in love But we just knew and we saw things that happened in our families and some things that tore people apart that by creating kind of this gray area in the space of finances was not going to do anything good for us. And so I think just being open and honest about conversations was the first start. Uh, The second thing I think was Joseph was patient. And while he understood that I was doing all these things that I could possibly do to grow my career, increase my income. There was something in my mental space and capacity at the time that was not ready to receive the message of fire. Mm -hmm. And so while he was doing everything that he could to, you know, help steer some of our decisions in the right way, he jumped at the decision of us being able to go to Singapore on my expedite assignment because he was like, oh, wait, 
your company will pay for our home or like we'll pay for our living in Singapore. We can rent out our home. We could pay this off. We can make this money. Like in his mind, he was like, this is a great financial opportunity for us. And while I knew that he was already, already really thinking like, how can we really make the most of this? And and lo and behold, that was a big reality of our situation. So I don't want to say he used the opportunity of me falling apart to bring <laughs> fire back into it, but I think he understood that at that that was what I needed at that point in time. And he knew me enough, right, to to know that that was the right point to reintroduce that and say, like, let's do this together. Here's the end goal of why I want us to think about this. And he asked me in 2020 to read Quit Like a Millionaire with him for Christmas. Great Christmas pre- present, by the way. Yeah. And we did. It was the first book we literally read together in two weeks. And I was done. I was like, this is it. This is what we're going to do. This is possible. This is real. This is relatable. Give me all those YouTube videos that you've been sending me for the last five <laughs> years. And uh, let's get at this. So, um, yeah, I think a lot of patience, a lot of transparency, and a lot of willingness to be uncomfortable has been helpful for us. Oh, I like that. Um, because that is something that um, a lot of people, especially, I won't say especially women, but I guess on the statistical side mm-hmm. of the house is that um, women move at the speed of safety. And mm-hmm. when it comes to, because you, you care about the I don't say like the men don't care about the family either, but majority of the time it's like you're moving as a unit. Um, And that's one of the things I love about uh, having a woman's perspective on a lot of things, especially when it comes around finances, is because, you know, as a guy, we like, all right, here are the numbers. But, you know, what happened? What about the aspect of the whole family? Like, you know, Mm -hmm. how about the feelings of, you know, you're picking up everything, you're leaving things like. Where, mm-hmm. where does that fall in? Um, mm-hmm. And I like what you said earlier was that you had the, you are more than what your job is. Mm-hmm. Um, can you talk about how to get women to think about more than just their um, their career and and to understand that like they still have a life outside of it? <laughs> yeah, this is a really interesting topic because in the day and age of, and I think we're still in this, and we should still be in this because we need to be of women can have it all mm-hmm. like we're intersecting into these um norms that are no longer that are they're becoming broken right i was definitely dead set on i was going to be in corporate america create this career i was going to do great things like and I, if i would have stayed i would have made it work <laughs> i would have made it work maybe as a very shelled individual probably but i, I would have made it work um and so we were told we can do it all. We can have it all. And while I think there's parts of that that are true, it's not have it all at the same time. Mm-hmm. Um, because corporate America and the way that work was established, the 40-hour work week even, was not created with women in mind. Right. And my husband does a great job at helping take care of the kids, being a very present father, wants to continue to, you know, um, grow our relationship. Like there's all these things that he really desires for us as a family unit. And for a little while, I can admit, like I was very much like of this mindset that, oh, I need to prove to everyone that this woman can do all these things. And um, I think I allowed that narrative to consume a lot of the decision making that I was making and the sacrifices I was saying that I needed to make in order to make all that work. And in reality, as much as I thought that everything I was doing was, you know, for the loyalty and the recognition and like all of my work was being valued, the moment that I said I was gone, I was replaced in a second. You can be replaced in a second. As much as you say, like, I'm doing all this work and I'm I'm invaluable. Mm -hmm. Like, I do valuable work. I create amazing impact. But there was something about growing up at this company that I believed they were going to take care of me. When in reality, some things were really shifting in the workplace for me. I was getting some feedback that I was not really liking. Um, I was being told things like, you should be more humble. You should wait your turn. Uh, those types of things. Yeah. And when I was really kind of taking a, a, a look around me, 
I was recognizing that those things were being told to me and to women more than others. Um, and so, you know, I think I was mourning a bit of what I believed corporate America was in my mind mm -hmm. and realizing that the identity that I had pent up and all of that was a lot of what I was just being told. And my experience was turning into something a little different. Now, 95% of my time in my job was great until it wasn't. Right. Um, and then that's where I really realized uh, and I can go create more impact and more meaningful impact in a space that I feel a lot more aligned with um, and not necessarily, you know, moving computer parts across the globe. I want to help them. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Um, because this goes into the second uh, segment, which is talking about the uh, adversities and come, overcoming them. Um, and so one of the questions that I just came across on Twitter, I thought it was actually a pretty interesting conversation to have mm -hmm. with you, is <laughs> do you think nine to five is a scam or a hack? Ooh. Uh, I think it's kind of a glass half full question, quite mm -hmm. frankly. That's how I, I heard it in my mind. That's immediately what came to me. I think it could be a hack. I, I think it could be a hack. I would not change my decision to start my life career at the company that I started it with and the majority of the path that I took. I had amazing leaders. I had great advocacy and support. The leaders I had, interestingly enough, were very diverse. Um, not very many women, but very diverse. And so I think I was really given a lot of great opportunity, not just because of the color of my skin and I was the diverse candidate. I was doing freaking amazing work. I'm going to say that right now. But I do think that there, it says a lot for um, being able to bring people up by creating diversity at leadership levels, right? To 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 make some progress there. So that being said, there's amazing benefits that you can take advantage of with your 401k. Um, we took advantage of our healthcare in Singapore as an expat. Our healthcare was 100% covered and paid for. Like I literally would just what? go and claim everything and it was covered. Of course, I was paying for healthcare, right? Like yeah. the amount that I paid for my, fam for my family per paycheck. But like in Singapore, it cost 30,000 sing per child pretty much when I ran the numbers to have mm -hmm. a child. That was covered. Every single bit of it. I had no deductible. And so I looked at all the benefits, right, that were coming to us through my time in corporate America. And there are real benefits to being in a nine to five job. If you're an entrepreneur, and let's say you don't have a situation where your spouse is working in you know, corporate America or for the government, you have to go and pay for very expensive health care. You have to go figure out a lot of other <laughs> things that you have to cover, right? Um, and it, I think I saw something come out the last couple of days that if you look at your benefits overall from a company perspective, what you get in take in pay is about 63% of what the company plans to pay you as an overall compensation bucket. Mm -hmm. The other 30 to 40% is things like your health care, um, your therapy. 401k match, all yeah. of these things, right? And so it really behooves us to hack our nine to fives and understand all the benefits so that we could take advantage of them. Um, that's how I see it. Nice. So when you're on your journey to fire, well, like, I mean, we talked about a lot of the different adversities that you've been through as far as mm -hmm. one is like, obviously moving your family, changing your mindset, getting around um, the fact that you can actually do this. <laughs> Yeah. What uh, What do you think would separate um, people who would actually take on that journey? Um, say if somebody is right now on the cusp, what would you say to them to, you know, just jump right out there? I would say, believe your gut and don't listen to everyone else around you that are the naysayers. When it came to moving to another country for us, Mm -hmm. Or and I can I can clearly think about multiple situations and scenarios where my husband said he would do certain things and people told him that he wouldn't. And man, does that freaking fire him up because he eventually does it. And he's like, why would I listen to everyone else that hasn't had these experiences? It's just a naysayer holding me back, right? Mm -hmm. And I think it says a lot for people to just really evaluate who's in their ear. That could be family members. It could be friends from home. It could be, you know, Susie and Sally that have been your neighbors for years and you're like, maybe not going to live there anymore. And they're like, but, you know, all of this that we have built here, you know, whatever. You're right. Um, 
And our decision to move to Singapore was a shocking one to an extent to a number of people, even in our family. And we didn't have kids yet. And we made the decision to move to Singapore and have our children abroad. And oh, by the way, COVID happened and we couldn't come home to see everybody. Um, So in a Mexican household, that's like a big (laughs) no-no. But I think just not allowing the negative and the naysayers in your ear to sway your decision-making, trusting your gut, and being willing to understand that just because you take one step forward, the work doesn't stop there. It's constant progress. It's constant learning. It's pivoting. It's realizing that you can fail and just learn from your mistakes and not just, but learn from your mistakes and figure out ways to move on and understand the failures and try not to make them again. Um, I'm still learning. Yeah. Whether it's, you know, in our personal finance journey as a mom, as a business owner now, um, it's the beauty of life and tomorrow's not guaranteed. So why are we going to sit back and think status quo is okay? That is, <laughs> that's, that's, you can hear a pin drop after that one. I was like, <laughs> oh, that's so great. It's like an awakening <laughs> right now. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Uh, now let's go on and move on to the future side of the house, which is the third segment. Um, because I use, I love this question only because it helps you. Um, it helps me honestly to try to figure out what type of habits that I would actually like to kind of piggyback off of, uh, to Mm -hmm. go to that next level. So the question Mm -hmm. is, um, what are the skills or habits that you feel that would, that you need to take yourself to the next level? Yeah. Skills wise, and I think it's always the soft skills are so incredibly important these days versus like hard skills that the world's just changing, right? And and so that constant improvement, the the willingness to learn, the willingness to figure out how do you learn best. There are so many mediums in which you can learn information, whether it's personal finance. Um, you really want to master your health. So you want to, you know, double down on yoga, or you really love the fact that, you know, you want to create this different future for yourself. So you're going to get, you know, life coaching, whatever. There's YouTube, there's podcasts, there's books, there's in-person events, there are meetups all over the globe, right? There are all these different ways that you can put positive influence and change and education in front of you. Be careful, right? Right. Be, you know, uh, evaluate what resonates. And that's the great thing about diversity now in this space, right? There's so many um, amazing, experienced, varied, experienced people that can now be in your ear giving you this information. Um, so I think the constant learning piece is the skill. From a habit standpoint, the thing that I'm learning now um, is that you have to have this balance between all these spheres of your mental health, your physical health, your financial wellness, right? Um, the relationship health that you have, whether it be with your partner or uh, relationships that you had in your past, maybe mom, you know, your relationship with your mom or your dad is not great and you want to heal that. There are so many things that go into being able to holistically move forward in life as a complete human being. And while you may not be able to have all of those things, you know, in one season of your life, I do think that those of us that can make the time and the space and have the capacity to think about it that way, allow us to heal and move forward from things that we might've been carrying for a really long time and leave, live our most present life and self. And so for me, I'm not sure if you are in the uh, trauma Yes. Session at at FinCon. Yes. That's how I stood it. Yeah. Yes. That that's where we probably yeah. Now I get it. Um they were asking we were had had this conversation about talking about entrepreneurship and being a nine to five employee and making sure that we were very careful as creators or mindful as creators of the type of triggers that we could invoke across our audience by saying like entrepreneurship or bust. Your nine to five sucks. Why would you even be you know that type of thing? And it really did hit a chord with me because I really did love my time as a a, a woman in corporate America. And I still see Stephanie as someone who could be very successful in a space where it was all aligned. It was majority more aligned with what I needed at this point in time in my life or even in the future. 
And I was literally crying in the back, sharing my experience about how that conversation really was creating some level of emotion for me. And then I spoke with my mom afterwards because she was at FinCon as well. She's a therapist. And so she's listening to all of these conversations about financial trauma and wellness, et cetera. And she was really encouraging me to really think about seeing a therapist again this year mm -hmm. because there are some things that happen. I allowed something to rob me of something in myself throughout the maybe the latter time in, in, in my corporate experience. And I need to work through that because I want to be able to help women as a very whole woman yes. um, when they're navigating that space and figuring out financial independence for themselves. And while I have my own experience, I need to heal some of that experience to be able to move forward. I like that. Um, because it's now I'm thinking of it, you know, like how you said with the family unit. Um, mm -hmm. And in your your bio, you do talk about having that lasting legacy uh, for people in their personal lives and also in that community. Um, you know, going through that, you know, having that thought process that actually resonated with you so much, what would be um, a lasting legacy? Um, let's leave a legacy today. What would it be for the women uh, out there that you want to leave a message for them to think about? Uh, as they start building their legacy. I think as you start building your legacy, the more that you can live in your most authentic skin and self, the more that people will be able to remember you and understand what you really truly stood for, mm. no matter how long you had on this earth. Right? I want my boys to see me as a working woman speaking with amazing people connecting with people globally, um, being able to build a business from the ground up, take the learning I had over the last 15 years and not be defeated from that experience, um, be able to be a present mom and do that and show them what boundaries look like, right? I wasn't very good at showing anybody what boundaries looked like <laughs> in the last 15 years. And it takes a lot of discipline and it takes a lot of understanding what you value and what you stand for. And so, you know, it may come with maturity, right? Um, but that's what I would recommend to women is what is authentic to you? What is living in your own skin feel like? And for me, if I had any slight regret, I've been thinking about this a lot when it came to my time in my career, there are, there are some instances where I feel like I wish I would have spoke up more mm -hmm. and stood up for things that I didn't necessarily feel like were right, whether it was like compensation conversations or HR conversations or leaders barreling down in a conversation that it was just not necessary and wasn't respectful. Um, now knowing what I know, if I had that emergency fund that allowed me to just like unapologetically not care and not, not care, but care about what I was going to say and know that if there were repercussions to it, I'd be fine. Mm -hmm. I would have led in a very different way. And that's what I hope for women, honestly. Like, I hope that women will be so comfortable and confident with what their money says to them and the progress that they've been able to make and that they have that emergency fund. So that as they choose to take these riskier moves, moving to the company that they thought that they, you know, didn't deserve or the role that they weren't ready for or that meeting that they were going to have to say something that wasn't going to be well received, that we wouldn't feel apprehensive about doing that because we wouldn't, we wouldn't have the pushback would be fine. And the re repercussions would be fine. Yeah. I think men do that pretty well. Uh, yeah, and I think part. we get in our heads a lot about it. It's all right. Um, man, that's a good way to end the third segment. <laughs> you ready for the full segment? Yes. Which is uh, the last final four questions. But before we go over there, um, is sure. there any question, like anything that you want to leave everybody here today before we dive into the fourth questions, final four? Um, just in terms of comment or? Or just in general, like, do you want to leave anything with them? You know, I, I think um, as I've navigated from the time as a woman in her corporate space, and now into this financial independence middle phase, let's say I'm semi, we're semi-retired, right? We're still working. 
I think the thing that I've noticed and my husband and I have noticed since we're talking about couples and money is when you retire early, you have so much more time to spend with each other. You have more time to be present with each other. You have more time to get in each other's hair. You're not the 65 year old coming home to retire to your significant other. That's like, here's how many years we have left and let's just go travel and do the thing. Right. Mm -hmm. And so my husband and I have had to figure out different ways in which we're going to communicate uh, how we want to spend time with each other, how we want to spend time with our boys because they're young and like we can be here and spend time with them. And so as you're, as your audience is thinking about like, how do I want to pursue financial independence and how do I want to retire early? Go do that for sure. It's a great thing to do. Also have a plan on how you want to navigate that new time that you may not have thought you had before. And it's, if it's with a cup, another person, like a significant other, have that conversation with them on what you guys want it to look like. And you know, I think we were just realizing while we knew we wanted this for ourselves and we had ideas of how we wanted to spend our time, we're now realizing that there's this navigation of change that we're having to figure out because we're just with each other more than we had been before. So, and we have a lot more time to grow with each other. So, yeah. That is awesome. Um, man, I never even thought about that. Like, what do you do with your free time? <laughs> Because uh, I did interview somebody that was on there. They were supposed to retire last year, but they decided to continue to work. So I'm going to talk to them once they finally retire um, and ask them about their free time. Like, what do they decide to do? Or you can come back on. I mean, I would definitely love to have you back on once you're like, yeah, I'm done. Yeah. Yeah, you you let me know. I'll, I'll let you know when I'm done. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> come back, or we can recap after FinCon again this year. We'll see. Sounds good. All right, uh, ready for final four? Yeah, let's do it. All righty. Number one, what does wealth mean to you? Yeah, I think a lot of the. I think of three. I think the physical, the mental, and the financial. And a lot of people hear wealth and they immediately revert to the money part. And maybe that's more rich in a way. Mm -hmm. But wealth, right? And I guess W does have kind of three little ticks in it. The the mental, the physical, and the financial piece. If they're really in balance and if you're focusing on all of those, wealth is a bit more holistic. That's how I see it. Mm -hmm. I like that. That's a whole other topic. Because um, <laughs> I would like to delve into each one of those. It's like, how do you use wealth in the physical and the financial and the mental? Um, yeah, but I have to bring you back on for that one. For sure. Uh, number two, what was your worst money mistake? Yeah, I've made many mistakes. But the one I think that sticks out the most, I'll, I'll probably say the most impact one. After my husband and I got married, we used a credit card. And that's actually not the mistake. It's what happened after. Um, so we used the credit card and I was we, we paid it off in a year. We paid about $20,000 for our wedding end to end. And I think you made a poll about that. 20K is what we yeah, yeah. And uh, But I had never really used a credit card before. And the idea of using a credit card scared the you know what out of me. Like I just didn't want to have to owe someone money on a credit card. Like we had our house, we right. had cars, we had student loans, but the idea of using a credit card, like I just always used my debit card. Like it was, I knew what money I had. Mm -hmm. That's what we used. Uh, and so I swore we were never going to be in a situation to need to pay for something large like that and have to use a credit card. And so the way that I went about it was, well, let's just save all this money. And of course, we're working on our careers, we're growing our income. And so we're saving, 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 saving all this money. By the time we got to 2020 and we were reading the book and we were like looking at our net worth and everything, we had saved around 500, a little over $500,000 in a savings account. Wow. Savings account, not a high yield savings account, a, a savings account. Wow. And then, of course, I really realized what investing was. I had been investing in my 401k since I was 20, 23. Mm -hmm. um, but man, 
What a missed opportunity between (laughs) 2015 to 2020, five years of compound Mm -hmm. interest gone away. So yeah, we immediately figured out what we were going to do with that money. Um, (laughs) (laughs) You know, we just didn't, I didn't know any better. Yeah, I thought, and and, you know, somebody on another podcast asked me, why 500,000? I didn't have, like, that was a nice rough number. Maybe it was just because that was at the point that we were, um, but yeah, hmm. in a savings account. So, okay. Yeah. We got more to dive into. <laughs> <laughs> um, so number three, what is your favorite financial or non-financial book? Yeah. Uh, I definitely have to say, well, two, two books, but I think there are so much, they're kind of both financial books. Quit Like a Millionaire is my number one go-to. It was written by a couple with a very female, like strong female voice perspective, uh, very data-driven type book. And so it really worked well for me. I loved it. Their story, um, how they presented what FIRE was, be tax efficient, effective with what you're investing in and in which accounts. It just really all clicked for me coming out of that experience. The second one, which is most recent, is Cashing Out. And man, the amount of times that Julian and Kristen Saunders, rich and regular, have me in their DMs, like <laughs> I read this one page and I have all these thoughts. Their avatar for that book was Stephanie Gonzalez. I'm telling you, and while it was very much made for for a very specific community, and like I just they spoke to everything I experienced and really did a great job of i think putting a lot of thoughtfulness into what they did in that book Mm -hmm. so most people that ask me for recommendations on books those are just those are the two i give all right yeah i'm gonna have to check out cashing out i haven't read that one because i've been following them for a while just uh never picked up the book yet so good so good let me know what you think once you get into it will do um i'll ask it for my birthday present so I get oh. books on my. Like, when's your When's your birthday? In July. Okay. Okay. I thought it was gonna be this month because mine's this no. month. But yeah. <laughs> nice. Okay. Well, happy birthday if I don't talk to you then. Thank you. Um, number four. What is your favorite dish to make? Mm-hmm. We love food. We're big foodies. We'd eat out every day if we could, but it's not a good idea. Right. We cook a lot more at home. Um, my favorite go-to because it's simple and it reminds me of home is Mexican rice, like Mexican red fried rice. Um, I can make it in 20 minutes. Mm-hmm. I know exactly what I need. The kids love it. They, they eat something I make, which is great, <laughs> <laughs> but it reminds me of home. Um, you know, I grew up with a village, really, you know, my mom and dad worked very hard. They were both working a lot. My grandmother picked us up from school every day. My great aunt, who is technically my grandma on my mom's side, was moved to the city that we lived in, you know, to be with us and to help us. And a lot of what I remember about or think about, you know, when it comes to family is food. And I really have been thinking a lot about being able to create memories for my boys around food. Um yeah, so I love cooking Mexican rice because it goes with everything and it's great and it's a flavor of home and I can make it really well. Nice. Yeah. I love that. Um, do you, I know this is the last question, but um, did you get a chance to go back home yet so everybody can, because I know you say you've been out since COVID, so. Yeah, um, I, the first time I went back to the U.S. was for FinCon. So oh. I set foot on U.S. soil for FinCon. Um, but I immediately turned back around, come back uh, to to Lisbon to be with my family. We were supposed to go in January, but I released my Women's Wealth Investing Effect program in January. And when I was really evaluating, like managing that and family, and it was a new launch and I wanted to do it well and I wanted to do it right, uh, we pushed our trip back to March. And so our plan is to go uh, spend some time t- in California and Texas in March but we're waiting on our boys' residency cards for Portugal. And so, yeah, we're fingers crossed that like in the next week, we get them. Um, And assuming so, 
we will be going back to see family for the first time. They will see my second son. They've seen my first, mm -hmm. but uh, yeah, we'll, we'll hopefully be able to see family in March mm -hmm. for spring break. Mm -hmm. Well, we uh, hoping you guys make a safe travels and everybody get to see each other for the, um, well, I guess another the reunion. Year. Yeah. Reunion. <laughs> Yeah. Right. So the very last question of the show is where could people find out more about you? Sure. You can find me on Instagram at women's wealth effect. And you can also find me on LinkedIn at Stephanie Gonzalez, just my personal LinkedIn page. Right now, um, I have two ways in which you can work with me. Number one, I have a free mini course that I launched in October called Kickstart Your Relationship with Money. It's a six module course. You cover money mindset, debt effectiveness, fire, why women should be investing, compound interest, expense ratios. It's a really rich, free video course. So it's online, like it's an actual course for free. Um, over a hundred women have signed up for that course. And my goal is to get that to a thousand by the end of the year. Let's go. And yeah, I'm excited. Um, and my second, the second way that you can work with me is through my new program called the Women's Wealth Investing Effect Program. And it's an extension off of kind of the, the free mini course, but it goes into a full-blown course related to investing investing for financial independence, but I also pull my 11 years of supply chain and sales operations planning experience. And I help women build uh, with tools that allow them to really project their financial future and their financial forecast. That was the way that I really got my head wrapped around what is all this for? What am I investing? What is it going to mean in five to 10 years, 20 years? And while it's a forecast, right? Mm -hmm. You know, it's a hypothesis. It's a scenario. It's not exactly what will happen, but there are ranges in my process. We use data and historical information and we advise, right? It's history may not necessarily 100% repeat itself, but you know, this is the information, the data that we have. If the top businesses across the globe run off of forecasts and run off of data and analysis, why can't we run our personal lives operationally the same way, right? There's, you know, a lot of other things, right, with money. But um, I think the differentiator in my course is really helping women become comfortable with the idea of being able to project their plan because life is going to happen. Yeah. You're going to have kids, maybe, maybe you're not going to have kids, you're going to buy a house. And so as your life happens, you can revisit your plan and understand what financial decisions you're making in the now and how they're going to impact you in the future. Um, and so, yeah, that that course is uh, currently going through its first, first cohort and the second one will launch in April. Nice. All right. So that was a lot of things. So you guys out there, is it okay that men sign up for these courses too? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. Well, when I run through mine, I'll, I'll let you know how it goes. <laughs> cool. Sounds good. Sounds good. Um, all right, everybody. So one of the things that I have to say, uh, if you got anything out of this particular episode, please make sure you go ahead on and like, subscribe, share. If you're listening on audio, please give us a five-star review. Let us know what you think about it. Uh, Stephanie will definitely uh, be notified uh how mm -hmm. you think about this particular episode um let me know yeah and um yeah so i have to say everybody please make sure you go out there and get well with your finances get to know your your why get to understand what your projections are and why you're doing everything that you're doing uh for your family mm -hmm. all right everybody y'all be safe thanks for having me thank you so much stephanie